got the names and addresses of the Square Wheels Club, and we talked to them. We checked their cars, and each of them volunteered to assist us in attempting to locate the hit-and-run vehicle. Frank put in a call to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital and talked again to Dr. Hall. He told us that the victim's husband, Carl Chapman, had been placed under the care of his family doctor and had been given sedatives to make him sleep. 7.15 p.m., I called Lieutenant Don Mann and filled him in on the developments. 8.47 p.m., Frank got back from the crime lab. Hi. Any word yet? No. Got a call from Al Doolin a little while ago. It's a hot rod club, huh? Yeah, he says all the clubs in the area are looking for the car. They've divided the city up into sections. The members are all checking the streets. No luck, though, huh? No, not yet. They've turned a couple of cars, but they don't check out yet. Anything on the wire? No replies. How'd you do? Oh, pretty good. Got the report here. Had a couple of sandwiches sent in. Got oh, you a yeah. Swiss on rye. It's in the bag. Right? Any coffee? Yeah, there's a carton there. Mm -hmm. Here. Oh, good. The well, lab sure did a good job on this stuff. All right. Yeah. Here's the scene. Here's the dope. The body was found 10 feet, 4 inches from the northeast corner. Mm -hmm. And, uh... I'd put it about here, wouldn't it? Yeah. Four feet, eight inches from the north pedestrian crosswalk. Right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We found particles of broken glass. Here's a shot of that. Checked them at the lighthouse. They're lenses from a Ford, 1940. That's the picture on them. And here's the um, gutter of the northwest corner. They found that bumper guard. Mm -hmm. I checked it. It's new. Any brand name on it? No, and they're sold all over the country. There's nothing there. How about skid marks? Any sign of them? Well, none that they could find. Either the kid didn't have time to use these brakes or he didn't want to. That's what they got there. There's some rubber from a tire. And Lee says he thinks they were made when the kid dug out to get away. Just on the back wheel. Yeah, looks that way. Mm-hmm. Sure indicates that he didn't mean to stop at any time. Well, that's the way Lee's got it figured, too. Mm -hmm. Well... Not much to go on, is it? No, nope, they've come easier. Well, we can go out and check the neighborhood again. They might be able to turn up a decent description. Mm-hmm. We can start checking the garages in the morning. Try to turn a car with a broken headlight and a missing bumper guard, huh? We got it. Get run felony, Friday. Yeah. Is there anybody there? Uh-huh. No. No, keep it under surveillance. Yeah. No, we'll be right out. Be careful. Don't burn it. Right. Bye. That looks like it's beginning to go our way. What do you got? They found the car. Frank and I notified the crime lab of the find, and then we left the office. During a routine patrol of the streets in East Los Angeles, a radio unit had come across a car parked at the curb of Vancouver Avenue. They'd stopped to investigate and found that it matched the description that we'd sent out. We talked to the officers in the police car and they told us that they hadn't seen anybody near the vehicle. We checked the white slip and we found that the registered owner was a Gregory Moore. Listed was a Hollywood address. While the crime lab went over the car, we drove out to Moore's address to talk to him. He lived in a large house built in the mid-twenties. Frank covered the rear entrance while I rang the front doorbell. Yeah, what do you want waking me up this hour of the night? Police officer. You have a tenant here by the name of Gregory Moore? What about him? I'd like to talk to him. You're too late, Mac. He ain't here. Where is he, do you know? I don't know. Moved out this afternoon. Didn't say where he was going. <laughs> told us that Moore had come home that morning, packed his belongings, and left the house. We called the crime lab, and Lieutenant Lee Jones told us that they'd established that Moore's car was the one that had run down the Chapman girl. We talked to the other people in the rooming house. None of them could tell us where Moore might have gone. We put in a call to auto records, but the car was not listed as being stolen. Frank called the name into R&I, but he found he had no record. From the occupants of the rooming house, we found that the suspect had no relatives in this state and no close friends that they could recall. <laughs> In going over Moore's room, we found a wastebasket that he'd used to dispose of articles he didn't want. In the basket, we found several match folders from a bar over on West 7th Street. We put in a call to the bar, but we found that it was closed for the night. From the manager of the rooming house, we got a good description of the suspect, along with the information that he received no mail and that he was apparently unemployed. 
We asked that we be contacted immediately if the suspect returned. 3.36 a.m. Frank and I checked out of the office and went home for the night. Wednesday, April 8th. After we contacted DMV and asked that they give us all information on the car, we drove over to the bar on West 7th Street. It's not open yet. Don't open until 10. Police officers, we'd like some information. Licenses back there in plain sight. Nothing going on in here. You have a regular customer named Gregory Moore? We just opened the doors. We got no say about who comes in. As long as they don't cause trouble, we don't. Guy about 21, 5'8 to 5'10, 165 pounds, blonde. Name's Moore, Gregory Moore. What's he done? We want to talk to him. About what? Police business. You seen him? Nothing that's going to get the bar in trouble. Now, look, that's a very simple question, mister. Have you seen him? Maybe, yeah. Tell me what this is all about, and I might be able to help out. Now, look, you're running out of time here. Have you seen Gregory Moore? Yeah. When? Last night. Here? Yeah, he was in, got liquored up. I tossed him out when we closed. Where is he now? You better ask him. Now, look, I'm going to tell you just once more. If you know where he is, you're going to save yourself a lot of time by cooperating with us. I run a clean place here. I don't want any trouble with the cops. My license is back there. I got no choice of the customers who come in. I don't want to get mixed up in anything. We're not calling it that way. That's the way it is. It's a clean place. Yeah, well, that's not what the book says. You've been tabbed a couple of times for serving minors. You run B-girls. You haven't served straight liquor in here for a couple of years. Now, if we have to get the information from you downtown, that's the way it's going to be. Get your coat. Well, now, look, fellas, I was just trying to take care of myself. You did a real good job. Get your coat. Isn't there some way we can work this thing out? I don't want no trouble. All right, where's Gregory Moore? I tried to run a fine place. A couple times I've been fooled. Now, once more, where is he? I got him up at my place. Is he there now? I guess. He got pretty loaded last night. He told me he didn't have any place to pad down. I took him home. What's the address? 1862 and a half Woodworth Court, room 14. All right. Let's go. Yeah. And don't try to call him. I got no phone in the room. If he's done anything, I had no part in it. I was just trying to help a friend out, that's all. Yeah, sure. You tell him that, how he got me in trouble, all because I tried to help him out. Yeah, we'll do that. And tell him not to come around here no more. Tell him to keep out. Tell him that, will you, for me? Tell him not to come back. Don't you worry about it. Hmm? Huh? He won't be back. <laughs> office and requested that another team of detectives come out to keep the bartender under surveillance in the event that he might try to contact the suspect. It took five and a half minutes to drive to the Woodworth Street address. It was a large building located at the end of a blind street. Room 14 was on the third floor in the front of the building. Frank and I approached the room and listened. There was no sound from the inside. Matches the description. Yeah. Let's wake him up. Now, right, come on, Moore. Wake up. Come on, Charlie. I don't feel good. Go away and let me alone. Come on, Moore. Get up. How many times? Who are you guys? What are you doing here? Police officers. You're under arrest. Okay, get up. All right. Let Stand me alone. Still. I'll do like you say. Just let me alone. I ain't done nothing. He's clean. He's got no reason to push me around. All right, come on. Let's go. Where? Where are we going? Downtown. What for? Manslaughter. I didn't do it. You got the wrong one. I didn't do it. Come on, let's go. But you got the wrong guy. I didn't do it. I didn't know what you wanted. That's why I ran. I didn't know what you wanted. Well, you do now, so let's go. The suspect was taken to the squad room where he was questioned. He refused to admit any part in the crime. He was confronted with the physical evidence and with the ownership of the hit-and-run vehicle. The witness to the crime came into the office and said that Gregory Moore was the man she'd seen at the wheel of the car when Helen Chapman had been run down. Throughout the interrogation, the suspect refused to say anything. Where is he? I know he's here. I want to see him. I'll take it easy, Chapman. I heard you call him. I want to see him. I want to tell him. Is that the kid? We think so. Are you the one? Are you the one who killed Helen? Well, answer me. Take it easy, Chapman. Is he the one? The evidence points that way, yeah. Please. I want you to do something for me. What's that? Please, get out of here. Go away, please. You know we can't do that, Chapman. This man's in custody. Please, leave me alone with him. Come on, Chapman. Let's go outside. Just a minute. Listen to me, kid. When they put you in that cell, you get down on your knees and thank God they found you before I did. You understand? You thank him, and every day you live, you thank him. You do that because I would have killed you. All right, Chapman. My wife's dead because of him. You hear that? You killed her. They got laws to save people like you, but none for her. None for her and my baby. 
They didn't have any loss. None for them. Come on. Pretty upset, isn't he? I want you to remember something. Yeah? In the years I've been in this department, I've seen some bad ones, real bad. Teenage kids that didn't know any better scraped up off the pavement and sent home to their parents. Drunks that were too loaded to know what went on. There's been a lot of them go through here, but you finish way ahead of the field, boy. You talk good. Bet you're on a lecture team around here. I'm getting fed up with you kids roaming the streets in those death traps of yours. I don't care about you. You want to wrap yourself around a post, you go ahead. We'll try to stop you, but don't you take somebody else with you. We've tried about everything in the books to make you understand. Doesn't look like any of them did any good. You all through? No, not quite. You killed a human being, a woman who didn't even know you. She never saw you until it was too late. You threw a ton and a half of metal at a 120-pound woman, and then you ran away and left her in the gutter to die. You wrecked a family. You tore it right down the middle and rolled over it. You've ruined the lives of all the people around that woman. You gave a group of decent kids a bad time because you stole their name. Now you get up on your feet and keep that smart mouth of yours closed, do you understand? Can I ask you something? Make it quick. Running that woman down, how much will I get? I don't know, but it won't be enough. October 14th, trial was held in Department 97, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and found guilty of manslaughter, one count, and received sentence as prescribed by law. Manslaughter is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period not to exceed five years. 